So I called Lynn. Big mistake. Hey, Lynn, you won't believe it. I was praying about this, and this is the verse that God gave me. She put the phone down on me. Well, hello everybody and welcome to our first Livewire session where we're looking at the Kingdom-centric course. There's going to be 10 sessions and hopefully you're going to find them really, really uh, super helpful. I'm going to start really with um, just talking about religion today. Um, I'm not particularly religious or at least I didn't come from a particularly religious family. But when I was younger, I had eczema, which meant I had a skin disease and yellow pus on my arms and legs. And I had to lie in a bath at night because when my bandages came off, my skin used to peel off. It was really painful. And I wasn't religious, but there was a, there was a teacher at my school who advertised a uh, what we would call a tent crusade. In fact, I'm going to show you a picture of the tent crusade right now. This is a picture of it. And uh, some of the boys from my school went and came back saying, oh, hey, Paul, this is really weird. We saw people. We think we saw them getting healed. You should go because you're a bit like a cripple. And so I decided, well, okay, I'm going to go. And I went, and when I got there, there was a preacher. You know this is a long time ago because the picture was in black and white, okay? But there's a preacher. This guy was preaching. I heard the message, the gospel, for the first time. Didn't really understand it completely, but thought somehow I just kind of knew it was true, right? So, um, And so he uh, preached, and he eventually did this whole thing where he said, hey, he asked these questions. Um, Do you want to follow Jesus? And I thought, yes. He said, so if you do, will you pray, pray this prayer? So I said the prayer. And then he said, if you said the prayer, will you please put your hand up? Which I thought was a little bit odd, but I put my hand up. And then he said, if you've got your hand up, will you please stand up? And I thought, this is the last thing I'm going to do, but I stood up. And then he said, if you stood up, please come to the back. And I thought, there's no way I'm going to do that. But it was quite a cute blonde girl, and she went to the back just then. And I suddenly felt God call me. It was really weird. So I went there, and I kind of gave my life to Jesus, and it was really good. And um, came out, and I, I got plugged into a church. And the first time I went to church, uh, the message I received was a message that these guys really wanted to get across. Uh, as you can probably tell, strikes were clearly in. And they just had this real passion about this message. And the message was this. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So if you put God first and his kingdom, everything else will be taken care of you. And I immediately found that to be true because I went to the Ten Crusade to get prayed for healing. But when I was being led to Jesus, that's when the prayer happened. So I missed out. And so I went back and I, I heard this message and I was told, you can pray directly to God. You don't need a priest. And so I prayed and asked Jesus to heal me um, very simply. And nine days later, not only had the septic stuff gone, but my entire eczema disappeared. And I've never had it since, which was yeah, absolutely incredible. And what I realized was this kind of back to front thing. So it wasn't the healing that brought me to God, but it was coming to God that brought me healing. And so this whole thing about following Jesus suggest that we have to move in a certain direction, right? If you're following Jesus, you're moving. But which direction are we moving in? That's what I want to talk about uh, today. All vision, it seems to me, comes from an awkward conversation. So we have these awkward questions. We maybe ask God one, and he asks one, us one back, and then we ask one more. And the more, if you like, we're here and God's there, the more we ask the the quite awkward question, the closer we get and more aligned we get to his will. And so I want to invite you into the biggest awkward conversation I've ever had with God. And it happened in a church building. Uh, I was in a church building, I was in a leadership team, and we were talking about the future of the church and our plans. And I remember leaning back and a strange question occurred to me. And the question was, is this a different religion? I know that sounds weird. But for some reason, some of the things we were talking about in the church, just it just didn't quite connect with me. I, I was reading what Jesus did. I was reading what we planned. And it wasn't that the decisions were bad, but just the motivation, the purpose behind them didn't quite click to me. And um, so it was a, a strange question. Is this a different religion? It just dropped in my head. And um, sometimes we think that Jesus had an issue with religion, but I don't think he did. Um, the word religion is kind of an interesting word. It comes from this word, the gear, which means to bind, tie, or connect. 
So I would say that religion is the way that we connect to God. How do you connect to God? I know we connect to the Father through Jesus, but how do we connect to him in our heart, in our mind, when we pray, when we serve, when we go to church? What does that actually look like? Jesus didn't really have a problem with religion because he said, I'm not here to abolish the law or the prophets. I'm here to fulfill them. And um, so I thought, well, if it's not that, what is it? And around that time, I'd bought my son um, an Xbox and uh, I imagined, we were playing a game, and I imagined what would happen, in those days it was discs, right? I've got an Xbox now, it's digital, I only have it for medicinal purposes now, obviously. But we had it, and I thought, if you take that disc out, and he gives it to a, his friend, but his friend doesn't have an Xbox, his friend has a PlayStation, and he puts that disc into the PlayStation, what will happen? Well, the answer is nothing. The problem is not the disc, the problem is the different operating systems, right? And I think what was happening was I had a slightly different operating system or I'd been taught a different operating system, if you like, than uh, what we were talking about in that church. So when we were talking about Jesus' message, we were kind of hearing it very differently. And I want to explain to you why I think that is. Jesus said this, A time is now coming when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. When I hear that, I don't know what you hear when you hear that, but what occurs to me is, so there's a kind of worshipper that God's not seeking? And what does that look like? Well, I'm going to unpack that, but I'm going to give a summary of them. I would say there's two types of religion. The religion that Jesus witnessed and the one that he wanted. And I use these two different phrases. I would summarize them this way. There's Christian-centric to pursue our vision, do it God's way, so that he gives us what we want. So we do the right things that God blesses us. We avoid the wrong things so that God doesn't punish us. Uh, But then there's kingdom-centric. Seek first the kingdom of God. So we pursue God's kingdom. We do it God's way so we give him what he wants. And I guess my question today is, which one of them best describes your religion? Let me just say before we go on, both of them are Christianity. Okay, it's not a case of one's not Christian and one is. It's not even a question of we're one or the other. For me, at least, I I have a percentage of both in me. But I'm trying to move from one to the other. So how would we do that? How would we move from being less Christian-centric to becoming more kingdom-centric? Well, let's look at what um, Christian-centric is. Before we do that, just to let you know, there's an appraisal. You can go online to kingdom-centric.com and you can take a little appraisal and figure out how kingdom-centric or Christian-centric you are. But we're going to look at being Christian-centric. Um, one of the questions I want to ask is this, is how do we know if we're missing Jesus' points. And I would say it's when we miss his context. When we miss his context, we miss his points. So Jesus said this. He said, For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. We have to understand that everything Jesus said, he pretty much said to believers. It's very rare that Jesus is talking to non-believers. They might not understand everything he's saying, but he's talking to believers. And he's trying to explain to them something they don't understand yet about their religion that God wants them to understand. And so when he's saying, don't be like the pagans, what does that mean? Does it mean, oh, don't be like the pagans because they, they, they eat babies and worship the devil? Uh, does it mean, don't be like the pagans because they, they're not spiritual and they just go after worldly things? That would make sense. Well, let me explain. Uh, This is a road in the middle of nowhere. It's in Turkey. It doesn't lead to a port, doesn't lead to a big city. And yet it's around about 23 kilometers long. And along the way, it has all sorts of um, different monuments to famous businessmen of the time or gods or all sorts of of different people. There's um, archaeology shows us there were restrooms, there were shops. A lot of people traveled down this road. But where were they going? Well, it was the pagans, and they were going to this temple, the temple at Didymus. And the temple at Didymus was was pretty impressive. It was a huge building. I don't know if you can see there a little picture of a person. It was six stories high, uh, made of basically white marble. It would have shone in the sunshine. Most people had only ever seen a two-story building. And they walk along this road. The anticipation is building. And then they see this massive, huge, bright building. Incredible. 
why were they going there? Why were the pagans going to this place? Well, the pagans were going there with a sacrifice and they would take their sacrifice to uh, a well and or actually would pass it to a priest who would take it to the well and the priest would examine it and wash it and clean it and decide if they would have the opportunity to ask their God a question. And if the priest said yes, great. If the priest said no, they'd have to go back down the road and buy a different sacrifice. So they would then wait. The priest would say, yeah, we're going to give your questions to the gods and, and see if we get an answer. And people would wait outside the temple. And sometimes people would wait outside for days and sometimes it would be weeks. Some people waited years. And then it got really weird because inside the temple um, was a woman, an oracle, who would be basically sniffing glue, getting high and connecting with the underworld and trying to get an answer to your question and surrounded, uh, this one would be surrounded by priests and they would write down any answer and make it more poetic and suddenly you would be told, the gods have spoken, you have your answer and you would, you would, the doors would open, somebody dressed like Apollo would read out the proclamation. It'd be amazing. This temple took 800 years to be built fully. It was a big deal because in those days they were thinking, wow, I'm about to get a word from God. Now we might think, well, the message is don't be like the pagans because we can talk to God at any point. But I don't think that's what Jesus was getting at. You see, there was a difference between the pagans and we as pilgrims, we go on a journey to follow God. And one of the main differences, apart from the God we worship, is the question we ask. Pagans would ask the question, if I do this, will you bless me? And Jesus would say, no, don't ask that question. Ask a different kind of question. Ask, what are you doing and how do I bless you? So the problem that Jesus was addressing is this, is he was saying to the people, look, the problem is you are you are just like the world. You want the world wants, what the world wants. You're just using God to get it. Don't be like the pagans. That's what the pagans do. They use their gods to get what they want. Instead, seek what God wants. Put his kingdom first. Now, I don't know, again, where you are on that journey. But for me, I know that's a process. It takes time and it requires me to keep moving forward. So what is it all like to be kingdom centric? What would the what would the signs of that be? Well, in this session, all I want to do is, is help us understand uh, the process of that. One of the questions is, how do we move forward? And the answer is, one step at a time. So I often say this to people, you know, when I became a Christian back uh, when I was about 14 years old, it wasn't I made one big decision and that was it. I made that first major decision in that awkward conversation with God who, will you give me your life? Yes, I will. And it's a bit like um, a, a hundred dollar bill, okay? And I, I give it to God and say, okay, God, I'm going to give you my life. Here's a hundred dollar bill. And God says, great. Now go and take it to the bank and cash it for what I think is 10,000 pennies. So I go and I cash it for 10,000 pennies. He says, okay, well, Paul, that's, that's my 10,000 pennies you've given me that, right? And I say, yeah, yeah, God. He says, okay, well, every so often I'm going to ask you for one of those pennies. For me, those pennies represents a choice. So every so often, I'm going to give you a choice to make. And this is a fascinating process because when we give that to God, it's not an opportunity to decide if we give it him because we've already promised it him. It's an opportunity to decide why are we giving it him, right? Why am I tithing? For my purpose or for his kingdom? Why, I, why am I coming to church this morning when I don't really feel like it? Is it for my purpose to be blessed because I turned up? Or is it to contribute something to his kingdom? Um, why am I serving? All these choices are an opportunity. Three quick thoughts about this. There's an ongoing process, an ongoing process. The two versions of Judaism turned into the two versions of Christianity. And so we read that. Uh, we read it when it says this. For everyone looks out for their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. So even in the early church, when we think about how amazing things often were, there was still this issue. Because it's an ongoing process. It's a process that's going to take time. Secondly, it's an ongoing possibility. Um, we don't live 
by fate, we live by faith. And faith is multiple choices. So there's a possibility. God knows that you can do this. God knows that you can be more kingdom-centric. Jesus never puts a little carrot in front of us just hoping to motivate us by promising something that's never going to happen. He believes in you. He believes that your whole religion and the way you connect with him can vastly change from something that's basically all about you to something that becomes all about him. But it takes time, but it is a possibility, which I think is a wonderful thing. And so over this uh, course, we're going to be looking at these various different subjects. We're going to look at righteousness next time. We're going to look at the gospel, I should say, and righteousness. We're going to look at uh, serving and giving and discipleship and prayer. And all these different areas are another opportunity to pivot from being Christian-centric to becoming more and more kingdom-centric. And then finally, it's an ongoing promise. Um, there are going to be some kind of tough questions ahead. It is an awkward conversation where you're going to ask God some questions and he's going to ask you some awkward ones back. But there is a promise, an ongoing promise. And the promise is this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. So that, that can be quite tough. Some of these choices can be quite tough. When I first met Lynn, uh, we dated and uh, I fell in love with Lynn and I believed I was going to be a missionary. And uh, I said to her, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and I'm going to go on a, a missions event. And the first time we met, uh, we actually crashed into a police car on our first date. And um, I also told Lynn, I kind of painted a picture for Lynn of what I thought my life would be like. And she can tell you, and I kind of said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be a missionary and I think my life's going to be full of poverty and maybe live in a mud hut somewhere in the developing world. I really laid it on thick to try and win her over, right? And uh, But the reason I did that was I didn't want someone, I knew I didn't want someone who was just devoted to me. I wanted somebody who would be devoted with me. I wanted somebody who, along this journey that I was going to go on, would be devoted with me. And, and at one point, I decided, and it was a very tough decision, to go and study to be a missionary. And, and Lynn knew God wasn't calling to that kind of life. And so it basically, she said to me, it's the mission field or me. And she calls herself a Christian. You wouldn't believe it, would you? Um, it's the mission field or me. And I went, it was really tough because I wanted to seek first the kingdom of God. And I remember so often I would, I would call her, how are you doing? Are you doing okay? And she would go, I'm all right. How, how is everything? Okay. And I thought, oh, attitude. Uh, she's not happy with me. And I got a bit upset. And I, thought, I remember one day doing the one thing I've never done before and never done since, which was, okay, God, speak to me. Just open my Bible. And it turns to be Ecclesiastes where it says two are better than one for they get a greater return for their work. So I called Lynn. Big mistake. Hey, Lynn, you won't believe it. I was praying about this. And this is the verse that God gave me. She put the phone down on me. Unbelievable. You think she's a nice woman, don't you, the foxy Lynn? But at the end of this um, time, I'd got it wrong and God, God very clearly called me to go back to Manchester. When I got back to Manchester, we, we kind of met up a few times and she admitted to me, one of the reasons she got so frustrated with me was when I called her, the day I called her to read out the verse um, to a better than one, she'd read the same verse that morning. And uh, so we kind of we kind of got married eventually. It wasn't long until we got married, and uh, we we kind of would. And the reason we got married was partly because um, she was still wasn't sure. And then we were in downtown Manchester, and she said, "I don't know if we should get married." She said, "You know what? If if when we turn this corner, there's a wedding, I'll marry you." We turned the corner. And bizarrely, there was a wedding. I don't know why. It's like going to the middle of, of Dallas and there's just randomly some wedding there. Never been one before, never seen one since. So my point is this. If you fight for the heart of the king, he'll fight for yours. Um, and, and then we made a big decision because we wanted to make the pay's apprenticeship free, which meant we had no money. And we moved into a house. and It was quite a rough house. And it was, there was water in the inside of the house. It was, it was pretty bad. The roof was leaking. We had one baby and another baby on the way. People were saying, oh, you should become a pastor. You'll get more money or charge for the apprenticeship. You know, that'll raise your income. But we felt, no, we want to get as many people on as we possibly can. Seek first the kingdom of God. And so one day, Lynn prayed for the house. I didn't know about this. I was out. She laid hands on the walls and said, God, heal this house. Well, 
Cutting a long story short, we got a letter through saying, hey, we're giving $12,000 or pounds to people's houses to fix the houses up. And we rang up, it's a miracle. We rang up, they said, oh no, actually, you're outside of the area. So Lim, Lim prayed again, two weeks later, they called us, oh, you're inside the area now. Eventually what they did was they didn't give us 12,000 pounds. They knocked our whole house down and rebuilt it with an extra bedroom for free. We owned it. Seek first the kingdom of God and there's this promise he will give you all you need. You know, my life's been full of adventure. I'm an adventurous person. and I've done everything from riding elephants to Thailand to kayaking down the Yampa River in Colorado and all sorts of things that normally a lad from Moston, Manchester doesn't usually get to do. But God's incredible. The key, though, is not to seek God for those things. That's the paradox, right? The more you do um, what God asks us to do, the more we give God what he wants for his purpose, not ours, the more he seems to bless us because you can't possibly outgive God. And I was just thinking about this question now. So what exactly is it that God wants? I think Jesus is saying this is don't put words in my mouth. Uh, the Bible uh, says this, if... If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The great thing about the promise is Jesus doesn't say once you've sought first the kingdom of God, but as you're seeking first the kingdom of God, all these things will be added to you, which is a wonderful thing. But we can't put words in Jesus' mouth. We have to listen to the words that come from his mouth. And Christianity isn't simply about believing in Jesus it's about believing in the things that Jesus believed in and his kingdom principles. It's not simply about trusting Jesus. It's about trusting in the things that Jesus trusted in, the Father. And finally, one of the most important things, it's not simply about wanting Jesus. It's about wanting what Jesus wants. And so my question is, what exactly is it that Jesus wants? Hey everyone, thanks for watching. In the description below is the Kingdom Centric Workshop. And while you're there, go ahead and hit subscribe.